And the movement continues on today. Even as Rodney was celebrating last week, I was reminded that yet again, God continues to move by the power of spirit through his people. And so what's next? Post-resurrection, what do we do next? We thought it'd be appropriate as we feel the, the pandemic lifting, as we move into a new season as a church family, to go back, to go all the way back, to go back to our original calling as a people of God. And I just want to pause along with Rodney and others and just celebrate you, our church family, for inviting so many friends. It was amazing. Last weekend was a great, great time. The whole weekend was incredible. We had uh, the Good Friday service here in, in the sanctuary and we were able to minister in, in smaller groups and one-on-one, a beautiful time together always. And outside on Easter Sunday, or I should say Saturday of Easter weekend, we had the, uh, the great big egg hunt. I think we had a thousand some odd kids out there running all around. It was just incredible. And then six services you saw on our campus many of you were here and uh, way to go church family I'm just so proud I told several this week I got home last Sunday um, I was ready to to just sit down for a little bit but um, I had a great morning and I told Stacy I saw her throughout the morning but I've never been more proud of our church family I've never been more grateful for our church family it was an emotional day uh, for me heart filled with gratitude to God because it's been such a hard year. I'm sure a lot of it had to do with the fact that we hadn't been together a whole lot. And we're seeing, as Rodney noted, things are lifting and we are grateful. We're starting to gain some traction and be able to, to move forward. And I just wanted to pause and say thank you as a church family. Uh, now, as, as great and wonderful as our gatherings can be and should be and always are, it's in our scattering that we see the movement that Jesus began, right? That's the thing about movements. They move people are on the move and always an outward seeking force we talk about that a lot we're on the move a centrifugal force outside of ourselves not turning inward not simply coming to a place if we're not moving outward that was the vision that Jesus had of course and what he's called us to and there's a lot of talk these days about church attendance Uh, In circles that, you know, I run in or read all the things that I'm about as a pastor, you might imagine I follow this stuff closely and kind of a cultural um, uh, student uh, of culture. And uh, the week of Easter, you may not know this, uh, Monday, the week of Easter, Holy Week, um, Gallup came out with their latest poll they've been doing since uh, 1937. And for the first time since this poll has been taken, the questions ask, are you a member of a church. Now, added to that is a synagogue or mosque, but it's primarily uh, church Christian people. Are you a member of a church? First time in our history, or at least of that research that's been done, that number dropped below 50%, 47%. And it was running right there at 70%, 75% for decades, and then came the new millennium. Bam, it dropped off in a dramatic fashion, dramatic pace. And so we've got to ask all the questions, right? Is what I'm doing all the time. Why is this happening? How can we combat this this drop, this decline in what seems to be the decline of the church? Now, some others get underneath those numbers and say, you know, the church of Jesus Christ will always prevail. He said it would. He said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So could it be that the church is being refined in these days? I believe that's the case. And I don't believe the American church is ready for the opposition that is now coming to us as believers. And so we've got to get back to our core calling. What are we about? What does the church do? Because as great as our gatherings can be, it's in the scattering that we are the church on the move. And so today we're going to start... Uh, a new series of messages we thought would not only chronologically make sense, but coming into this new season as a church, let's get back to what it's all about. We're going to get back to the book of Acts. We're going to look at the early part of the book of Acts. You can go ahead and turn in your Bible to the book of Acts, in fact. And while you're turning there, uh, we just thought, you know, following a a great, uh, an amazing year in so many ways, difficult year, but a wonderful Easter uh, weekend, we thought in this next season... Even our connect groups are walking through supplemental material that are helping guide and walk us 
through this time. We're going to look at the purpose of the church today. We're going to look at, uh, over, the, over the next several weeks, the power of the church, the priority of the church, the people of the church, the proclamation of the church, all the way to Pentecost Sunday it will be. But in Acts chapter 1, go ahead and turn there, Acts 1, we're going to look at verses 1 through 8. And in these eight verses, Luke answers four questions for us. Real simple today. Who is a disciple? Okay. Key question. What does a disciple do? When does a disciple do it? And where do we find disciples? Who, what, when, and where is how we break it down today. Because here we find our primal calling. Now, it's important to note as you read scripture, any uh, portion of scripture, to know what genre we're talking about. You don't approach uh, poetic uh, works the same as you would uh, a narrative. Or you don't approach, um, say, the Psalms just in the same way that you would history. Here in the book of Acts, the genre, if you will, is history. These are our people. This is the beginning of the movement. This is our family. And at the beginning of Acts 1, Luke, the author, you may know this, Luke, who's a doctor, he knows what he's talking about, as we'll see, He says this, in the first book, O Theophilus, you may not know that that the book of Acts and the book of Luke are a two-volume set. Uh, You might be surprised that Luke wrote 28% of our New Testament more than any single author. may surprise you if you know the Bible. You may have thought that Paul would have been the one. He was a missionary with Paul, but he wrote the book of Luke, which is the gospel, the story of Jesus. Important to understand this as we move into this, because he says in the first book, O Theophilus, and this, this by the way, uh, there's some debate as to who this was. The word means, his name means beloved of God. Some have said this is a proper name. It's a person. I tend to lean that way. Others have said, you know, no, it's actually, it actually references a group of people. So it's him, the original reader, or them, or certainly the word of God, us. So him, them, us, yes. Okay, all of that. So, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach. Okay, keep that in your mind. All that he began to do and teach. Now, watch this. He's saying the whole gospel, okay, consider this. Christ has died on the cross. He is risen. Now he has ascended. He's going to record that, chronicle all of that. He says, but I I told you about all that he began to do. Now, this is interesting, right? Is he not gone? Is he not? He began a movement in all that he began to do and teach, implying he's still doing and he's still teaching. He's still guiding us until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. All right, so this is, again, the second of a two-volume set. In the first book, he says, right, he's writing to Theophilus. Now, here's what he says. He goes on. Let me, let me run to the book of Luke real quick. Watch this. In the first uh, part of the book of Luke, he says, hey, having followed all these things closely, I thought it'd be appropriate that I write these things down because I was along with others. I know the eyewitnesses who were there. And he says, I've written all these things down to write an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things that you've been taught. So he says, this is why he wrote the book of Luke. Now back to Acts 1. Acts 1 again, he says, now those are all the things that Jesus began to do and teach. This is the story of the movement of the church. This is what we're about today. The church has its beginning and end in Christ in all that he has done, okay? So I've said it this way, before the church ever existed, before there was a mission of the church, there was a God who is on mission. It, it's been said that, that it's not so much that the church has a mission in the world, but that the God of mission has a church in the world. We are fulfilling his mission. What is the purpose of the church? We'll talk about today, we'll say that ultimately, the purpose of the church Okay, we say it is to make disciples. But watch this. Before that, okay, more importantly, the church exists to bring glory to God. That's why everything exists. That's why anything that does exist exists. It's why you exist to bring glory to God. We do this by making disciples. So let's go there. Who is a disciple? Who is the disciple? Before you get this in your mind and say, well, I got this down. I am one. This is a critical question. 
Uh, It's almost assumed here because Luke is saying anyone who would respond to the risen rabbi Jesus is going to be a disciple. It's just what supernaturally follows. The only way to respond to a risen Savior is to become an apprentice, a follower, a disciple of Jesus. Now, this is worth noting. The most common designation for people like me, for us, many of us, is in the world today, I am a Christian, right? That word has been hijacked and now means a lot of things to a lot of people. Uh, many non-believers in the world would, would, if they know any Christians at all, they would then think that they're, we're a part of one of the major religions of the world. We have adopted a particular religion. Others would, would say that a Christian is someone who's adopted a particular worldview or ideology. Uh, others, even in America, would say, non-believers, many would say, well, that's a, that's a voting block, perhaps. If we talk about evangelical Christians, that, that's a group that it's really a political um, focused group is what it is. That's how a lot of believers or non-believers see Christians today. The word Christian is used twice in the New Testament, both in derogatory terms. The word that's used 261 times is disciple, apprentice. It's someone who has decided to follow the rabbi. And in Jesus' day, it was a Talmud is the Hebrew term. A Talmud would join a Talmudine if they'd make it through levels of education and they would be called by a rabbi. The common phrase was hak hai halai, come follow me. If you made it to that level of education, the cream of the crop, then you could follow after a rabbi. Note Jesus calls those who are not educated. He calls those who are marginalized, those who have been pushed out in society. He calls people like you and me. He calls others of us to follow him, to be his apprentice. But here's the thing I want you to see. Can you be a Christian in the way that most of us would think as believers about Christians? Can you be a Christian and, and not be a disciple? Biblically, no way. They're one and the same. Some people, even Christians, have come to believe that you become a Christian. And then if you move to the next level, really get serious, you become a disciple. That's not what we find in the Bible at all. You're either a disciple or you're not. And if you're not, you're not a Christian. The Bible says that Jesus calls us to be his disciples. And watch this. Even the way that we do discipleship, if we're not careful, can eliminate Jesus as the rabbi that we follow. So the question begs to be asked today. Think deeply about this. Are you a disciple? of Jesus Christ and I've said you know it's possible to even go to church every week and fewer and fewer people are doing that in these days possible to go to church every week not follow Jesus every day you're not a Christian if that's the case not the way that Jesus would describe his followers and so we respond to the grace extended to us in this in this risen savior who comes to us and says, I've died on the cross for you. I finished all that needs to be done. I live the perfect life for you. I have died, taken on your punishment upon myself. Now you're set free. And not only that, he's risen, proving he's God. He gives us the power of his spirit as we'll see here in the book of Acts. Now we're able to live and follow him as apprentices, as disciples 24 seven. In Jesus day and Luke and his first readers would have known this. A disciple follows after the rabbi, learns to eat what the rabbi eats, speak like the rabbi, live like the rabbi, sleep with the rabbi, walk with the rabbi, live with the rabbi. To follow the rabbi, there was a common phrase that you were to follow in the dust of your rabbi. Be covered in the dust of your rabbi. An image that I want you to implant in your mind this week and ask the question, are you truly following Jesus or do you claim to be a Christian? Two very different things. I think that's in part why we're seeing membership, attendance, and our influence wane in our country today. Because we've decided that being a Christian is something other than being a disciple. And so the book of Acts calls us back to our original 
calling that we find in Jesus. Who is a disciple? The disciple is someone who has responded to the grace of God. Yes, the risen Savior. And said, I belong to him. And I'm giving my entire life to him. 24-7, following him every single day. Is that you today? Is that, is that what describes the way that you live? So this may help us here. What does a disciple do? There's a lot of talk about who is a disciple. But what, this might be more, even clearer. A disciple testifies to what Jesus did and taught. By obeying his commands, by following the way of Jesus. Again, all the time. Look at verse 3. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. So what does a disciple do? Well, three things. And this, is, this, bear, this bears out throughout scripture. We, we do three things. We prove, okay, first of all, a, a disciple presents Jesus alive. Look at what he says, many proofs. So what do we mean by proof? Do you have to... Go to, go to seminary. Do you have to get a doctorate in, in, in apologetics? Do you, do you have to give evidence just for his teaching? Reliability of God's word. How do you prove that he's alive? Watch this. By the way you live. Because he is alive in you. When you come to Christ, the spirit of God resides in you and you live and love. Watch this. It's a movement of people who are in love with Jesus and it is a movement of love. I was captured by how we were singing about it earlier. How the Lord's called us out. And here I am. I obey. Do we sing these songs and actually live them out? That's always our hope. We choose songs. We worship. We pray. And to aspire and inspire one another that we might live this way. A disciple proves by the way they live that Jesus is alive. We prove. We preach is what it says. We preach. Now, now, maybe not preaching like I'm doing. That's part of it. But it's how we preach the gospel every single day. Speak about the kingdom is the way that it's put here. Talk about the way of Jesus. As you follow him, he speaks to us and through us. Look at verse 4. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem. These are the disciples, his, his followers at this point. Not, not just the apostles, but all the followers. But to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. And he'll go on. But look at this. We prove, we preach, we pray. What do we do in the waiting? We know through this text, the Bible tells us, what did they do in the waiting? See, listen, this is important to understand. Many of us are waiting for many things in our life. We always tend to be waiting. We're waiting for this. We're waiting for that. Many of you are waiting now. What do we do in the waiting? We pray. Christian waiting is not passive waiting. Christian waiting is active waiting. What do we do? We pray for the power of God to move. And watch this. We pray for God to draw us to himself. That's a constant prayer in our lives. Lord, draw me to you. Let me know more about your love. Because look, because being in his presence is more important than anything we will do for him. It's a great distinction for us as disciples. In fact, anything we do for him is only done with him as we practice the presence of God in our lives. I've said it this way, as a people, as a church, as an individual, there is no progress without presence. Too often groups of people get together and seek progress, even if it be kingdom progress, church evangelistic progress without presence. Not gonna happen. So we pray for him to move and we call out for him to change us and to be drawn to him and to be a faithful presence wherever he places us. He says, for you heard, heard from me in verse 5, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Not many days from now. So as we wait, we call upon the power of God to move among us. Watch this. Disciples are cleansed by the Spirit of God and follow in obedience. I want you to see this. I talked to a group of folks who gathered uh, earlier today. We gathered with some, uh, some of our, our, our guests and many who've been coming, some of our newest members out on the lawn this morning. We talked about the fact that as Christians, as members of our church, we are 
We are saved. We believe all that we've been talking about this morning. And we are baptized by immersion. We're baptized believers. Because his followers are marked by, by the Spirit, okay, changed by the Spirit. You could say baptism of the Holy Spirit and baptism by water that marks us as his people. On the move now in his family. Don't miss this. What a disciple does comes out of who a disciple is. Transformed by his love, then we enter into this. So a disciple proves, a disciple preaches, a disciple prays. When does a disciple do this? Who is a disciple? What does a disciple do? When does a disciple do this? Well, like us, the disciples were impatient. We do this, waiting on the next big thing, right? We always laugh a little bit, but ponder the fact that many come here on Easter Sunday who are not back this week. You get bonus points. You're here. And I say that. We, we, we kind of laugh about that. It means that everyone who does come here along the way comes on one day is what that kind of means on Easter. Why do we not come every single week? I know that there are reasons that people don't come. And everybody who's not here today would probably tell me they've got a good reason not to be here. And many of you online, we're so glad that you're watching us here online. You're not yet feeling comfortable coming back. We understand that. But there really does come a moment where we say, you know what, I am devoted, I'm committed, but, but we're always looking for the next big thing. Looking for, well, come Christmas, I'm re- I'll come next Easter, I'll be there. We look for the next big thing and we're always looking for it. This is the way the disciples were. And look at verse six. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And some of you know that they had a different understanding that we do now of what Jesus was really accomplishing here when are you going to bring about the kingdom this would be a good time because i mean good grief you you you've been raised from the dead you're you're you've been given all authority it seems let's go let's do this and they're still thinking when will the insurrection take place when will we when will all this worldly power become ours you take over we're with you so we share in the power they're still thinking about earthly power and human strength and then in verse 7 He said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the father is fixed for his his own authority. Jesus said, don't worry about times and seasons and epic moments, the big things. God's in charge. He's got that. That's not even your focus. So he immediately said, your focus is instead to follow me, obey me moment by moment. Be faithful in the moment. I've talked a lot about this in recent days. Success as a disciple of Jesus is to be faithful, a faithful presence in the moment with whomever he puts in front of you and whatever he's called you to do. You do that all day long. You go to bed at night. That will be success for you. Do that again when you wake up. Do it for months, years on end. That's a faithful life. That is success in the kingdom of God. And that's essentially what Jesus is telling them. Don't worry about all that stuff. You be faithful. You know, on on Easter Sunday, I talked about how many of us need to reframe doubt um, as deconstruction of our faith. There's a lot of talk about deconstruction these days, but we've got to do it, I said, in community, and we've got to do it according to God's word. Because what I've seen in so many people's lives, many people that I talk to, who are struggling with faith or those who don't believe or those who are atheists, oftentimes they'll, they'll say, you know, I have intellectual problems with Christianity. I, I talked to a couple of folks this week and it's kind of, you know, I have intellectual problems. What I've discovered are, are intellectual problems are, are most often moral problems. Jesus said, you don't believe because you don't want to believe. And many people are living with sin in their lives that they don't want to give up but they have intellectual problems when it's actually a smoke screen to moral problems and issues in their lives. We don't want to repent. We don't want to change. And Jesus is saying, don't worry about the big stuff of life when this or that will happen. Instead, be faithful to me. James said it this way. Listen to James 1, 21. So get rid of all filth and evil in your lives and humbly accept the word God has planted in your hearts. For it has the power to save your souls. 
The Spirit of God, when we believe, comes into us, gives us power to consecrate our lives, to give our lives over to him, to live holy lives before him, to reject sin, overcome sin, and live differently. Then Jesus says, you want to talk about power? Let's talk about power. Verse 8. You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Not earthly power, not worldly strength. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the end of the earth. Be my faithful witnesses. Faithful wherever I send you, wherever you go. Now watch this. Now there's progress with presence. Because that's the only way that it comes. So when do we do this proving, this preaching, and this praying? We do it all the time. We do it all the time. And it looks a lot like blessing other people every single day. We begin with prayer. We listen to them. We eat with them. We, we sit down. We get to know them. We serve them. And we share our story with them. That's it. Jesus is saying, don't worry about the big things. The Father has that covered. Be content, live calm and and non-anxious lives to be a non-anxious presence in the lives of others. Then you're free to love others just as Jesus has called us to love him. So who is a disciple? What does a disciple do? And, and, And when do we do this? We do it all the time. We, we're not sometimes, you know, full-time Christian, part-time disciple. You're full-time, all the time, all the time, seeking to love others and draw others to him. Well, well let's, let's close with this. Where, where do we find disciples? Well, he says here, there's four places where we find disciples. I want you to think about this differently today. Four arenas of people, areas where we see people where we can make, find, and make disciples. All right, the first one is people we know. All right, so we're going to learn throughout this series, where do we start? How do you do? You start where you are. Why was it Jerusalem? That's where they were. Start in Jerusalem, and then we go from there. But here it is. We can apply it this way. Jerusalem is close, tight-knit. These are people we know. These are people that think like us, act like us, probably have the same skin color, cultural you know, priorities, and, and they, they probably vote like us. They, they're a lot like us. There's a problem with just hanging out with people just like us. Two problems. One, you live in an echo chamber. Everybody agrees with you and it's all that you know and you never grow, you never change. And you might be wrong about something in your life. (laughs) Secondly, Jesus will not let you stay in Jerusalem. He will not let you stay with those people. Look, he says, people you know, yes, make disciples. This could be family, could be neighbors, people you work with. These are people you know. But again, they're a lot like you. And then next, people like, uh, who are like us. Okay, people you know, and then people like us. You go into Judea, these are people who are still a lot like us. And if, if Dallas, you could say, these are, these are Texans. These are people, maybe they're not in my neighborhood, but they're people in the area. They're Texans. They, like me, belong to the great republic of Texas. All right? They're, they're like us. And he says, that's a good place to make disciples as well. You're going to do that, but you're not going to stay there. You don't stay there. Instead, I'm going to call you out. I'm going to call you to people, how about this, people not like us. I'm going to call you to Samaria. And again, this just doesn't have to be just a geographical thing. We don't want to go to Samaria. These are people who don't look like us. These are people who probably have different skin color. These are people who have... You know, they look different. They dress differently. They have different backgrounds. They have strange beliefs. They don't vote like us. They don't think like us. They have different ideas. They may not even know Jesus or who he is. And if they do, they might be confused. And they need somebody to straighten them out. And I hope somebody will. And Jesus said, no, that's what I'm saying. I'm calling you to go to them. You are the one who will go to them. And you're going to come across them this week. They don't worship me. And I'm calling them to myself through you. People we know, people like us, people not like us. How about this? People we don't know. People we don't know. This is to the end of the earth. This is until the whole world knows. We want to tell others about Jesus. And we do all of this with eager expectation uh, about his, in light of his coming again. Eager expectation of Christ's 
return. It goes on to verse 11 where it says that he's going to come back in the same way that he's ascended. Why are you standing here? He's coming back. Get on with it is what he's saying. So here in this one passage, we have the resurrected Jesus. Okay, the resurrection has happened. Cross, resurrection has taken place. He's about to ascend. He gives the commission, the great commission in another form there, to be witnesses. Martyrs is the literal term. Martyros, witnesses throughout Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the end of the earth. And then it says, and you know what? In the same way he's, he's ascended, he's coming again. Between his first, uh, in, the incarnation, his first coming, and the second coming of the verse 11, what do we do in between time? We bring glory to God Almighty by making disciples. That's the call on every single one of us. Now, as I close us here today, many of us need to get on the move. Many of us need to move. And I want to ask you, how are you going to apply this? How do you need to move today? Because if you're a Christian, you're a disciple who's on the move because Jesus is on the move. It's like jumping onto a moving uh, platform or vehicle. If you're going to jump on, you need to start moving. So what are you going to do today? There's a law of physics. It's a part of the, the law of inertia. that says that an immovable, uh, an immobile object, an object that's not moving can't be redirected. The only kind of object that can be redirected is an object that's moving. God is calling you today, calling me to move. And the move is always towards him. And he guides us and redirects us to what he has for us. And he leads us to where he wants us to serve him as his apprentices, as his disciples. To tell the world about what he has accomplished. To love them as he has loved us. So maybe your move today is to come to Christ. Maybe your move, you're watching me online or you're here in this room and you've never received Jesus. Or, or a light bulb came on and you realized early you thought you were a Christian, but you've never responded to Jesus and his resurrection and all he's done for you as an apprentice, as a disciple. And friends, there's no distinction. Or maybe you're thinking, you know, I am a Christian. I know that I'm a Christian, but I really need to live my life with an awareness and practice the presence of Jesus, friend, as your rabbi every day. You follow him. Not me, not the greatest Christian you know, not your mama, your daddy. You follow him. You hear from him. You listen to him. He is your rabbi. I think this is a call to all of us to a new devotion to him. Some of you need to move, literally join the fellowship of this church. And then others of you, you've never been baptized, identifying with a body of believers, and that's your move today. And I want to encourage you to make the move today because God is on the move and he's calling you and me to join him in this wonderful movement, the greatest, the most important thing you can ever give your life to, the greatest adventure on the planet, to be a disciple of Jesus. From Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria to the ends of the earth. May we live that way this week. Let's pray together as we close. Lord, we thank you that here in this place we experience your presence together. I thank you for everyone who's watched us online and is hearing your word proclaimed today as they've worshiped with us. Lord, I ask that you would call each of us, myself included, Lord, I want to be your apprentice, to be like you, follow you, speak like you, think like you. I want to carry your yoke, your teaching. I want to follow you with my entire life. And I want to draw others to you as you've called me to. Lord, we want to all be the church this week on the move. So we give you our lives. And for those who don't know you, Friend, listen, I want you to, with your eyes uh, closed and head bowed, to receive him right now by faith, by faith, receive his grace and all that he's accomplished for you on the cross. Say yes to him. Say yes to your rabbi, Jesus. Follow him every day of your life. It's our only right and logical response 
when we consider, Lord, your great love for us. We love you. We devote ourselves to you. In Jesus' name we pray. And we all collectively said together, amen and amen.